Okay, are, are they on? Yes. You guys are on? Let's do this. Well, hello. Uh, we're Team Titan from the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm Elizabeth Beattie, and these are my teammates Nick Parada, Nico Vladimirov, and Nick McGill. So for the past eight months, uh, we've been developing a powered upper body exoskeleton. Exoskeletons have been around in mostly research uh, since about the mid-1960s. Um, so these, these exoskeletal devices can be used for things such as assisting a user's strength, enhancing their natural ability to lift objects, um, as well as physical therapy and rehabilitation and assistive mobility. Um, so that's what really motivated us to want to develop a proof of concept exoskeleton was to take the research from the laboratory and apply it to a device that you and I could use on maybe an everyday basis, a once in a while basis if we were injured and needed therapy or rehabilitation. So those motivations dictated a lot of our design goals, um, which include having um, distributing the weight from the peripheral limbs um, onto a structural back plate. So making a low weight limb that doesn't bog down um, the user's natural limbs. Also, we wanted to implement non-localized joint actuation. So instead of having the actuation be at the joint, we actually have it on the back. Um, in addition, you'll notice that Nico is completely tetherless. He's not plugged in, he's completely battery powered. So we have the ability to operate um, in a variety of environments. Uh, we also wanted to have um, a high usage to charge time. Um, so about two hours of operation, 40 minutes of charge time. For how much? Uh, two hours of operation to 40 minutes of charge 40 time. Um, and that's based on lithium polymer batteries. So in order to um, meet all of our design goals, we've integrated some critical um, system architecture, some subsystems. So we have an electronic subsystem, a structural subsystem, and also an actuation system, which my teammate Nick will get into more detail about. Thank you, Elizabeth. So, um, as Elizabeth mentioned, there's two main mechanical subsystems. Uh, the first is the structural, uh, and that comes from the back plate, out through the shoulder, uh, along the user's arm. And uh, the highlights of this are the back plate, which uh, provides rigidity to the user's back. Uh, this decreases the chance for bad lifting posture and hence, mm -hmm. hence injuries. Uh, from there, we have a uh, three degree freedom shoulder joint um, that closely mimics uh, the natural range of motion of the user's shoulder. And then from there, it uh, comes out along the user's arm to the actuated elbow joint. Um, so, in developing uh, the structural subsystem, we did both uh, classical and numerical uh, analysis, including FBA, um, to test out our components. Um, the uh, structural subsystem works with a factor of safety of 1.3. Um, and then uh, from there, uh, we're able to develop this frame to which we can attach the actuation system. Um, the actuation system has three main subsystems. We've got the DC motor, the cable drive system, the transmission power, and the braking system. Um, so to start with the DC motor, we chose it because it uh, offers a great power to weight uh, ratio at approximately uh, 200 watts per kilo. Um, and also, it's uh, fairly inexpensive for the strength that we're trying to add. Our, our system allows uh, up to 40 pounds of additional strength for the user. And also, it's familiar to implement and control. Um, it provides power out to uh, the cable drive system, which are these spools to which we have mounted twin cables in a pull pull configuration that run through this sheathing to the actual elbow joint. Uh, this sheathing it acts a lot like bicycle cables uh, in that it's flexible, allows the user to be mobile, but it's also powerful. By using the system, we were able to really make sure that occupational lifters would be able to do what they need to do without feeling encumbered by the uh, The third part is the braking subsystem. That's uh, up here, this uh, ratchet and fall system. Basically, that's necessary because the DC motor is great, it's strong, but it can't hold static load. Um, eventually, you'll overheat the coils, causing permanent damage. So to handle that, we have this braking system, which uh, engages with a simple servo-driven uh, pulp, and then that allows uh, unidirectional locking. So you can lift with the motor and then hold statically with the uh, actual pulp. Um, I want to stress that all of 
these components were manufactured in-house uh, by our team. Uh, something we're really proud of. We spent well over 300 hours in the machine shop. Uh, but uh, it's all uh, its all basically for naught if you don't have control over the system. So to talk a bit more about how it's all monitored and operated, uh, it's my teammate, Nick McGill. So um, we've got a structure, we've got an actuation system. How do we control it? Uh, if you look at this architecture diagram, you notice that we've got actuation braking, um, and then here come in the microcontrollers. So uh, because we wanted a tetherless uh, supply for, uh, for our exoskeleton, we actually implemented our code on a Beagle Bone computer. So uh, this is a very powerful processor, 720 megahertz, and um, we actually ended up implementing a M2 microcontroller. It's an Atmega 32U4. Uh, um, this does the low-level control, so it talks to the DC motor, um, and this is the reason for having that. It's actually because when implementing on Beagle Bone, it's a three volt logic system, um, and the, we're running a, a five volt logic through the motor driver board. And we actually uh, wanted to make sure we protected our ninety dollar microcontroller with one that was much cheaper, much more available. Uh, so we've got serial UART communication, uh, ninety six hundred baud running between the two systems, and then um, we actually also have a wireless communication to the Intel Beagle Two. So uh, this is for our, our part of physical therapy. Applications. So uh, it's great having a suit and all, but having data is incredibly valuable for a user or a doctor. So the patient wants to know how they're doing over time, and the doctor does as well, and they also want to remotely monitor the patient. So the patient doesn't have to come into the doctor's office every day. Um, it's, a, it's a lot less burden on them and the doctor. So I'll just uh, take one quick plot. So this is, um, this is data we were running the other day. Um, so uh, right now you can see like uh, the other joints responding to whatever Nico would be doing on there. Uh, we have Hall effect sensors on each of the joints. So the elbow joint out here has one hidden in there, and the shoulder joints right here. We have a rotary potentiometer to get absolute encoding for the motor. Um, this is good so when we implement our, our software stops, we know where we are at all times. It's not just an incremental uh, increase. Um, so uh, we also have a power system that's using a DC-DC switching buck converter. So uh, to drive this motor, with uh, we're using high voltage and low amperage uh, to get the torque we need. Uh, so we're actually running two LiPos in uh, in series, so we're getting uh, 36 to 42 volts depending on the charge. Uh, we step that down so we can power our 5 volt electronics. Uh, the BeagleBone takes two amps when it's uh, when it needs to run a Wi-Fi dongle, uh, and then the M2 is like 250 milliamps. Uh, so with that, we also have uh, the servo motor to power. Uh, but yeah, it provides a, an excellent system for for control and actuation, which uh, the control loop is a velocity-based uh, PD control loop, uh, taking input from the joystick. Uh, Nico, I'll show you right there. Um, up and down, uh, and then the, it also takes in a digital logic signal from the ratchet. Uh, you'll notice also we have a safety switch on the bottom. That's our emergency stop, so it'll shut off the motor in case of any event of emergency, and we need to say, uh, save. So, the so, so stop for just a second. So I'm just trying to think about this. So you'd use this according to your personal like that for like physical therapy situations, or would you use it also for lifting something that normally you couldn't? Yes. I mean, lift right. Yes. So this aids this aids in that and in, in giving you more strength, I guess. It does. Or what, in a sense. Yeah, so um, I guess one of the reasons we wanted to have uh, this was so we could have a good visual aid. So doing, uh, doing the lifting and holding is something that everybody can relate to. Uh, physical therapy, when you're moving your arm around, it does show the data on screen, but it's something that's like, you can, if you can do a bicep curl, we're really capturing our audience's attention and saying... What was the ratio of this one that said how many reps? Oh, for the... Like the payload is 20 pounds, does it feel like what? Nico, what would you say? You're using this. Five. It's doing most of the lifting uh, for me. Really, what it's doing for the most part is reducing fatigue. So I can do this all day, whereas somebody without one will need to, you know, either have lots of exercise. And also the fact that, so for uh, an instance where you're working in a warehouse, really you just need to lift the weight and hold it there until you carry it somewhere. So that's why we have the braking uh, yeah, system, yeah, so it can lock yeah, in place, yeah. and I can just stand yeah. here all day. And literally, the motor isn't experiencing any loads. Everything is just completely just locked in place in the garage. So. I guess, Elizabeth, you want to take it on? So, um, I guess the next steps for our project, uh, as you can see, we have a proof of concept, single arm, single actuated joint. Um, we'd really like to extend this and build another arm. So, since we have the uh, available availability to build all of our structural links in-house, uh, we can very easily make a second arm. In addition, we'd like to actuate the shoulder joint. Right now, there are uh, three passive joints, um, and using localized um, actuation on those joints um, would definitely improve um, use of this exoskeleton in occupational scenarios. 
we'd also like to improve control with EMG sensing. Yeah, so uh, EMG sensing would be great because uh, as you, you're stressing your muscles, more muscle fibers are recruited. You can measure potential across that. With these signals, uh, actually, we, we were messing around a, a little bit earlier on uh, sending the signals through the FPGA, and that gives us fast hardware uh, processing uh, of these signals. So we'd love to implement uh, an EMG approach. And it looks like we're just running out of time, so we'd like to open the floor up for any questions you guys have. Could you, could you have, uh, um, I guess it's a constant, uh, constant communication. Let's just say you're out of communication. With it. Could, is there something that you could store and then once you get into communication, sent, or have you guys thought about that? Or? So uh, we're using the, the BeagleBone processor, which has lots of storage space. We can throw in a micro SD card up to 64 gigabytes plus 10. Okay. So yeah, we can definitely store it. Have uh, you thought about controls for I can lift it. I can lift double the weight with both my arms. Yeah. So how will we do the controls? What, like, what's your thought on that? Really good question. Um, so I guess uh, the next thing, the joystick's not very feasible, even though it's implemented in things like the exobionic suit. It's a lower body rehabilitation one. They use joysticks, but for something where you'd be lifting, that's where the EMG sensors we feel like would be valuable. Because if it's just using your already, you're already giving input from your motor, uh, your muscles, uh, using that signal, you'd be able to uh, fine, fine tune uh, the control. So okay. just a lot of filtering on that EMG signal would probably be a good way to approach that. Okay. And then you had mentioned there was a safety factor of 1.3, but I didn't know what that meant. Oh, okay, so right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in mechanical engineering, we tend to, uh, you know, we go through and we do all the design. We're looking at the forces, the torques that get applied to uh, all the components. And, um, and we do all the analysis, but it's extremely common practice in basically anything that gets built. You multiply um, those maximum loads by a small factor, and that allows for you know, made any simplifications during your analysis. Uh, this ensures the uh, proper functioning of the suit and the safety of the user. Okay, so it's 30% above and beyond the max exactly. rate. Yes, exactly. Or beyond what we expect to see with uh, max load of 40 pounds. Yeah. Okay. Can you explain how you did the whole verification slash testing of key features and where did you have big challenge or the most big challenge to cover? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I thought you said yeah. Um, yeah, so integration absolutely was a very important part of our system as a whole. Um, we had to make sure that we were in constant communication during the development and design. Um, and then when it finally came together and we were able to put it all together, um, a big part of uh, testing really was hitting all of our uh, strength and power requirements. Um, our suit, its functionality is judged via power. We figure that's the most meaningful thing. You want to be lift, being able to lift a load, but at a at a uh, speed that's respectable. So we're going for it's uh, 40 pounds or about uh, 17 kilos um, at three radians per second. Um, so we're able to track data and be able to compare uh, the actual output of the motor versus those. So uh, it was pretty neat for the testing. We went over to our, our school's gym, and so we got a lot of <laughs> eyes when we were yeah. going. Uh, I'd also like to remark, uh, Elizabeth mentioned earlier that we had a, a goal of hitting a two hour to a 40 minute charge usage to charge time ratio, we actually exceeded that by a lot. In our testing, uh, when we just had our suit, uh, we had a senior design project, and we ran off the batteries for over 24 hours just doing curls, um, and the charge time, if you're doing it safely, I mean, these are 5C batteries, so they can yeah. uh, up the average a lot. We did a safety, it's like, all right, in a half hour, we can charge them to max uh, safely. Um, so we've exceeded that ratio by a lot. If you compare your spec with the stuff out there, there are a lot of great technologies out there. How do you compare at the price point that you're in? Yeah. So actually, um, so we mentioned EXO, which is a lower body suit um, that's used in physical therapy and rehabilitation. And actually, that's kind of part of a pilot program with hospitals right now that hospitals can rent out and use the suit for a fee of about $140,000. Um, so we've actually been able to develop our suit for under 2000 um, That was our goal. And we've actually, the suit, um, everything you see here costs about $1,500. Um, so one of our, to make this accessible for, I guess, the general population, uh, we really wanted to make a low-cost solution. And that's something comparing to the other technology that's out there that I definitely think that we've achieved. Um, any of the environment, if it's moisture, foggy, is that 
for you? So uh, it gets the moisture, yeah. Uh, one of the things we definitely want to uh, we'll be uh, doing is putting a case on the back. Right. Obviously, you, you wouldn't want any things getting stuck in the ratchet or the spool. Um, so we feel like uh, once we have that in place, and we went through airport travel, which meant that drop testing was sort of inevitable <laughs> at some point during the travel. And it seemed to survive well throughout that. Um, we spruced it up. So we feel like it's uh, pretty robust as far as temperatures are concerned. It's got a wide range. Uh, all the components are rated uh, you know, within normal operating temperatures, low and high. What's the total weight of this thing? I mean, when you're standing, you're carrying what, 10 pounds? That was, actually, that was very much a part of our original design. So we wanted to make it lightweight because the last thing you want to do, especially in a rehab or physical therapy situation, is put on something that feels heavy and constraining. So we aimed for 30 pounds, which for engineers is basically a normal backpack. Um, and then, uh, but we were able to do much, much better. We come in at 18 pounds. Um, so mostly you carry the back, but your arm is about what, 5 pounds? Yeah. Yeah, the arm is very lightweight thanks to uh, predominantly aluminum construction. So you don't need to counter that weight on the side. So if the patient is wearing, you can go this way? Well, yeah. Uh, certainly we're looking to uh, create another arm uh, soon to offset those. But I would say, Nico, you're in the best position to answer that question. How does it feel in terms of balance? I mean, in terms of balance, I feel fine. We, we did have some issues where it was kind of tilting. Uh, our solution to that was actually the addition of all of these straps. So we took these straps from an army grade backpack in order to be able to distribute the weight properly. And I don't feel any kind of pressure in my arm. It's all distributed down through my back and then into my legs. So this, sorry, the, the remote feels heavier than that thing right now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's a lead control. Uh, uh, so, yeah. uh, uh, so in terms I'll of be throwing a humor there, in there. There's, there's no, I guess, uh, uh, active or, or passive wrist support because the the arm ends here. Right, right. 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 Yeah, I was, um, I was yeah. just commenting that you're writing the whole entire. Thing. Did you guys yeah. mention uh, cost? I I forgot. I didn't. Oh yeah, yeah. The yeah. Sorry. The entire system, as you see here, costs around fifteen hundred dollars. Fifteen hundred. Okay. So, including all materials. Uh, what if you what, what if you lift it up? And you yeah, you know, it doesn't include the so, I mean, uh, manual labor to put it together. Three hundred hours of machine time. Yeah, well, you know, if you guys were to go and ahead and, we, and try to do something beyond this, you, you would probably um, want to try to come up with a manufacturing yeah, exactly. yeah, or uh, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Because I guess yeah. if you want to. If you were in a situation that you and went then you guys would start using you plastic, plastic everywhere, oh, that's, that's, that's definitely yeah, a pretty good consideration. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The user might not, you know, that's 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 guy might not remember. Yeah. 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 So did you design all the switchers? Yeah, that is not the, the box yeah. switchers. Oh, uh, I looked up get some circuits time. online. Okay. There's a really nice IC. It was like yeah, like five hours. Not from the transistor level. Yeah, yeah. You bought the parts, filters on the outputs. Yeah, we were doing a lot of soldering, and so yeah, we bought. Okay, well, thank you. We're very proud of how much we actually did on the exoskeleton. Very few components were bought, and those were the necessary Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And things like that. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great meeting you, Great guys. Good, Good job. Oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> Thanks so that's our next project. <laughs> the claw. <laughs>